Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're very excited to have you today with us on this first edition of our FSI series, uh, webinar series. So the goal of this uh, first session is to present you the key trends and use cases that we've been observing in AI and financial services. A few words first about Das Haiku and the presenters. So I am Anne-Sophie Russler. I'm sales director uh, in FSI at the Taiku. So I've been working now for eight years with uh, first in Europe and, and now in ANZ on a major rollouts of AI implementation and projects uh, across the biggest banks and insurance companies in Europe and here in Australia. And I'm joined by Vincent de Stucklin today. Hi, everyone. Um, excited to be here uh, with you today. Uh, I manage the data science and customer success team uh, for Data IQ in APJ. I'm based in Sydney. Um, and for the past yeah, almost 10 years, I've been working to um, support the deployment of AI use cases in you know various industries, but um, predominantly uh, financial services. Thank you. Um... I will just uh, say a quick word of introduction about the Taiku, what we see the key trends in financial services, and then Vincent will do a bit of a deep dive uh, on certain of the main use cases that we're seeing. Um, first of all, the Taiku, who are we? Uh, the Taiku is a analytics and data science workbench for everyday AI, um, enabling business and technical users uh, to collaborate and ultimately to accelerate data-driven project delivery and, of course, value, business value. In FSI, we are uh, FSI is one of our biggest um, vertical at the Taiko. We have approximately 500 customers across the globe, um, and we have 80 clients that are in FSI. As you can see, logos from all over the world, uh, in the US, in Europe, and in Australia. Um, Westpac is one of them. Um, we work here with two of the five biggest banks. Uh, and we work across all activities. So from retail banking, investment banking, all the way to asset management, uh, fintech, etc. Now, regarding the use cases that we are uh, observing. So we help companies basically address all types of use cases across FSI going really from the classic uh, customer client uh, analytics uh, projects around churn, uh, client scoring, client journey, etc., cetera, um, all the way to risk management. So fraud, think crime, stress testing. Um, we see also more and more of um, operational efficiency use cases. So anything around, um, you know, uh, mail parsing, uh, optimization, request routing, all of that. Uh, investment related processes uh, as well um, and and so it really goes all the way from um, marketing thin crime all the way to you know uh, helping trading desks uh, detect more uh, market signals one of the major trends that we're seeing uh, currently and especially i'd say in anz is everything around process optimization, which doesn't, processing optimization, which, which doesn't necessarily involve um, machine learning and AI, but uh, is, is kind of data pipelining for regulatory purposes. Regulatory purposes here is, is something that drives, uh, and regulatory compliance drives a lot of, of investment in the AI analytics field. And that's an area uh, that's been, you know, that's been having a big uptake for us and that's becoming more and more important. Uh, in all the FSI um, companies that we are that we're working with, so we're, we're we're addressing more and more use cases in this area. I will now. Uh, this these are the, the 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 kind of introductions and 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 a couple of observations. Uh, I will now let Vincent deep dive a bit more and tell you something about a couple of use cases that we are seeing in this industry. Thank you, um, and sophie So uh, what we'll be mainly talking about today is um, use cases where we see a lot of momentum um, in financial services that are leveraging AI. I will say AI a lot, but you know, 
behind AI, um, you know, see data science, machine learning, modeling, predictive analytics, uh, rather than, you know, the purely marketing AI term, um, as well as some of the supporting trends as well. Um, so essentially, there are five things that we will uh, look at today. The first, and perhaps the more mature, um, momentum there isn't necessarily new, but how does AI help with customer value in financial services? Um, obviously, acquisition, retention, and top line is the name of the game. Um, and there's been since actually quite a, a number of years, a lot of um, enhancements and improvements that you can bring to the customer lifecycle with AI. So we'll have a quick look at that. Then there's risk and compliance. And I think Anne-Sophie was alluding to it. There are... Um, new regulations, there are, there's a lot more scrutiny from a compliance and regulatory perspective. And AI and machine learning have a very, very big role to play in how organizations get ahead of, you know, risk management and regulatory demands. The last one, because of course, any AI presentation, we wouldn't be complete without talking about chat GPT. Um, NLP has been a topic where there's been a lot of improvements on the technical side and that are generating immense value from a use case perspective in financial services. And with the new large language models, this is taking up a, a new dimension. Um, it's still early days, of course, when it comes uh, to um, the chat GPTs of the world, but organizations and especially FSI need to have a strategy around that. Now, in order to make this a reality and you know, linked to those use cases and value and outcomes, there are supporting trends that we see. The first is there is a drive to modernize infrastructure. And usually that goes in hand in hand with cloud migrations. We're seeing very, very large work streams in most of the financial services organization we're working with to modernize the technical environments, the tools, the platforms, and move uh, onto cloud infrastructures. And the other is, you know, everyone wants to become data driven right but you know ultimately there is a cap on the number of experts that one will hire right how many data scientists or data engineers are there on the market how many should you hire so in order to truly advance upskilling and data literacy are critical and we'll show a couple of examples of where it's worked well and what you should be thinking about so let's start customer value you know um, I don't need to spend too much time on this. Acquisition, retention of customers is the name of the game. There's been a number of trends with rising costs of acquisition, increasing competition. There are new banks, new insurances, and everyone's competing for the same financial surface or number of customers, right? Um, and linked to that, there is a lower lifetime value and lower loyalty and lock-in due to you know regulations. It's actually very easy to change your primary banking organization right now or to you know refinance your mortgage with someone else. So financial services organization are both have less loyal customers and are you know paying more money to actually acquire them, right? So they need to become a lot better at optimizing the customer journey. And this is where AI comes into play. This is a standard sort of uh, life cycle for uh, the customer journey from awareness and acquisition to service initiation to then upsell, cross sell and loyalty or retention. So how does AI and machine learning help? First, at the top of the funnel, I'm sure these are things that you're familiar with, AI-based targeting, personalization, segmentation of your users, and really going from the one too many, hey, I'm going to do an ad on TV, to very personalized messaging for some of your target personas, even to some degree creating a one-to-one a -one market segment. One thing that's very interesting there as well is what we call attribution um, modeling. So you have some you know, fairly complex machine learning models that really try to understand from you know, the multiplicity of touch points that you can have from, you know, a TV ad and a social media campaign and some emails and then, you know, ads on buses. What is the optimal way you should um, manage your spend in order to convert customers? Right? So proper understanding and what we call causal inference between, hey, this person went through this journey and here's how each touch point contributed is critical. 
and AI helps a lot there. As we go further along, account setup, I'm sure if some of you have opened bank accounts recently, it's really become something where AI is omnipresent, right? Chatbots, hey, I'm having an issue, I'm spending too long on this page, uh, something will pop up, you need help, right? And try to answer my questions without necessarily having a human behind it. One thing we've done recently is use computer vision for account validation. So if you guys have scanned your face, for instance, to match with the passport or to match against the database to see if the image is fake, that you uses computer vision in the background. Um, document analysis and OCR. So instead of going into a branch or sending thing via you know snail mail, for instance, being able to upload documents and for an automatic validation, check, risk analysis being done. That helps a lot with acquisition because you can set up an account in five minutes um, and it really helps as well reduce costs of managing those things in the background. As we move further down the line, you know, the name of the game is upsell and cross sell. You have a customer, how can you expand the financial surface that you have with them? We did a quite interesting project around life event detection um, so if you're familiar with what happens in, in FSI, obviously, one of the key things is, can I detect, anticipate, or predict when a life event will happen? And what does that mean for my customer? Some of the key life events for uh, banks are, you know, someone's moving, for instance, someone's trying to buy a house, someone has a kid, uh, someone's um, retiring. So all of those life events, which customers don't necessarily tell you, how can you detect through external data, through their transaction patterns, detect and recommend the right offer, the right action. And this concept of next best offer is really about scoring and prioritizing what the customer may want, may need, and how do we sell it to them? And then in retention, you know, churn has been around for a long time. It's really become a lot more sophisticated, uh, really looking holistically at, you know, transaction patterns, behaviors, interaction with systems. Um, and here I would name customer support as well. Um, I think people may tend to stay for good customer support. So the ability to really quickly understand, hey, why is this person reaching out to me? What's wrong and how can I help? That uses things like chatbots, things like, um, you know, predictive uh, uh, analytics to really try to parse through the universe of data that we have and recommend things. So customer value, probably the area where there's the most maturity, but really AI use cases all along the value chain. Now, if we move to the second, which is risk and compliance and broadly what we tend to call KYC or know your customer. Um, this is a regulatory obligation. It's really about understanding your customers' behaviors and risks. And in the background, what it helps is, you know, prevention of money laundering, terrorism financing, fraud, identity theft. And it's both something banks have to do to reduce their own risk, but also to report to full regulatory organizations. So typically, KYC is a four-step process. One, you verify identity, you assess the risk, and then on an ongoing basis, you have to monitor transactions flag um, illegal or suspicious behavior, and then analyze this and report to yourself and regulators. There's really been a shift in the way that's being done by banks. We went from a traditional model, which is basically business rule based. Right? I'll show an example later, but it's essentially, hey, we consider that someone making regular large withdrawals of cash um, may be a sign of money laundering, right? And then they're using it somewhere else and then money comes back. So it's a bunch of people that essentially thought about, hey, what are the patterns of fraud, of money laundering, and implement those flags, those rules on top of aggregated customer transactions, right? Then out of those business rules, we have a bunch of flagged accounts. Hey, all of those satisfy the metrics, the business rules that we've implemented. And now this goes to case officers that are actually investigating. Hey, this one was flagged as a one based on the business rules. Why? How can I know more? What documents can I look at? And do I actually validate that this is a one or a zero? We've really moved through the use of machine learning to a combination of those business rules, which are still you know, expert systems based on experience uh, and regulatory obligations, to add two things. One is the look using machine learning modeling in order to have a more holistic view on 
new patterns, right? So you're essentially looking at, hey, in the past, who's been a frauder or fraudster or someone who did money laundering? What in their behavior indicates that um, they actually committed fraud, right? And are there patterns that our business rules don't know about? What if someone's creative, goes beyond my business rules? How can I still flag those? So ML modeling, and I'll, I'll give an example later, um, helps a lot there. And the second thing that it helps to do is simulation or what we call what if analysis, right? What if I raised my threshold from 5K withdrawals per week to 10K? How many people would I have then, right? Are there more true positives in there or not? And through the use of those systems, instead of having a Boolean, so those guys are zero, those guys are one, you have a ranked probability of, hey, this guy is most likely a one and I have 90% confidence. So that helps a lot the downstream teams because they know what to prioritize and they have ultimately a lot more true positives in the uh, people that they look at. Um, and it costs a lot less ultimately uh, in terms of, of uh, investigation and reporting. So an example of that is a project that we did with a financial institution in um, Europe a couple of years back. Um, what you see on the left is basically what they gave us as indicators, right? So that was for finance, um, counter, counter terrorism financing. Um, so there was about 70 indicators, things like yeah, withdrawals on Fridays, um, uh, wire transfers to sensitive countries. So a bunch of business rules that we had to implement on top of customer transaction data, right? Um, pretty heavy data engineering, as you can imagine, the volume of transactions is huge. We have to implement and document all of those rules. You know, it took about, about six to seven months um, to implement all of those indicators. And, you know, we had a first deliverable, which I will call justifiable outcomes. We said, we did what the regulator asked for. So we were clean. We did what we needed to do. However, there was a lot of false positive. More than 80% of the people that we looked at through those rules were false positive. So you can imagine the cost and the lack of reliability of um, the system. Then we moved into phase two and enhanced the system with machine learning approach, really around three things. One, graph analysis. That's really helpful to understand relationship between entities and typically things like shell companies will have a network of relationships around them, who does wire transfer, in what direction, that is very dissimilar to normal organizations, right? So that's a flag and features that we could create through things like graph analysis. Anomaly detection also helps you to look at what is a standard pattern of a customer, right? And um, identify patterns or customers that are really outside that are anomalies in the way they interact with banking services. It may not mean that they um, are committing fraud, but at least it is something that we should be looking at in priority. And the last thing is a feedback loop. What's generally missing in financial crime is, you know, you do the business rules, people investigate, and then that's it, right? Here, what we did is loop back the result of investigations. Hey, this guy was false positive. This guy was actually a, a true one and then feed that back into the model to enhance the business rules to give a degree of confidence. One thing I will say is that this project was fairly complex because it's typically the case in expert systems that you have humans who know very well their, what they're doing, right? And they will have some resistance to having machine learning augment or enhance or, you know, they will think or they may think that it's AI versus human, right? Hey, I can do better than this, this ML model. You need to be very careful not to present it in that way because A, that's not the reality of how it works and B, change management will be extremely complex, right? It's really a case of human plus machine and enhancing the current business rules and providing more information to case officers to make the right decisions. Third, NLP generative AI, right? We really have three areas where NLP or natural language processing, so um, um, parsing, extraction of insights outside of uh, in unstructured data, um, three areas where it's um, become extremely valuable in the past years. First, voice of the customer. Um, every input that you have from a customer or most of the inputs that you have from a customer 
perspective can be unstructured data, right? So people calling you on the phone, people writing emails, people writing things on social media. So the typical techniques that we will use are things like, you know, voice recognition, translation, topic extraction, sentiment analysis. It means you don't necessarily have to have humans reading through things and you can extract insights of, hey, this customer is very unhappy and he, he's concerned about this. And by the way, if we see a huge increase in this topic being correlated with negative sentiment, maybe we need to change something. The second is document analysis, and especially for ESG, which is a you know, growing topic in many, many financial organizations, which is really about how can we extract meaningful information around ESG out of a you know, trove of do documents, right? In the past, you would have people read through all of that stuff. Now you can actually do named entity recognition, topic classification, trend analysis to really classify the documents, score topics that are related to ESG. You know how you know how prevalent is, let's say, environmental concerns in this company's financial communication, for instance. Right? So being able to score that on a large basis and then identify trends saves a lot of time and effort um, um, in that regard. And the last piece is, you know, large language models, generative AI, and chat GPT. This is really a step up. I think everyone was quite surprised by, you know, the maturity and the level of um, depth that those models can have. Um, I think it's quite early days when it comes to what are we actually going to be doing with it? Is it enterprise ready? You know, um, even things like, you know, data privacy concerns. You couldn't upload a PDF of your organization in there and ask for a summary, right? Um, but quite easily, you know, we could see applications with much, much, much better chatbots, which, you know, chatbots have been a big thing the last five years, but actually the ones who work well and not frustrating are, you know, uh, are quite few. Uh, things like automated report generation, right? So, you know, here's a big text or here's a meeting minutes or recording, generate a report, generate a financial summary. Um, those are things that, you know, it can help a lot with. And knowledge management as well, internally for organizations, you're looking for information, you know, some of the internal knowledge management system can be quite clunky. So how do we ask the right questions and find the right information quickly is something that a lot of people are looking at LLMs for. So those are really the three major areas where we see momentum, use cases, and value being delivered. But there are also supporting trends. Right? One is we see a um, move or a transition from legacy technologies and um, I guess legacy technology landscape to a much more modern infrastructure and tooling for data. A key part of that is cloud migrations. In Australia, actually, uh, the uh, prevalence of cloud is um, one of the highest I've seen, maybe except the US. Um, and most of the banks that we work with are already on cloud, which is not the case in the rest of Asia, for instance. Um, this move to cloud is also something that comes with a lot of new tools um, from you know ETLs, data transformation, data science with data IQ, obviously, and inputs and outputs, right? So SaaS applications for you know, customer targeting and so on. Um, why this is important, it's because the rationale behind it is obviously reducing costs from heavy on-prem systems, increasing scalability with cloud services, breaking down silos of, hey, finance have their database and you know marketing has their own and really ensuring that people can mesh data across different entities and create value out of it. But more importantly, enabling self-service. Right. It's how do I get the right data to make meaningful decisions for my business. Right. So there is a data democratization piece in this notion of the modern data stack. And this is very important because it's something that everyone is looking for. But depending on the culture of the organization, um, there's either more weight on the self-service and flexibility or more weight on the risk and governance. And balancing those two is actually a very complicated exercise because in a self-service world, what does data governance look like, right? Do you um, 
how do you ensure the flexibility for end users, i.e., hey, I want to use my own tooling and I want to access this data set, right? What happens then, right? Is it, is it accessible? Do I need approvals? Is it no by default unless I get some approvals? So managing all of that and managing the risks that are inherent to end user computing, i.e., I'll just download something, you know, uh, do a bunch of um, spreadsheet calculation and then send it to a customer. What is the risk associated to it? Yes, it's self-service. Yes, users like it because they can do whatever they want, but there is risk. Right? So managing the two and providing the right capabilities with the right governance is something that is quite complex and where you need a robust governance framework internally to make sure you have best practices and the right patterns across tools, across profiles. The last piece is, you know, obviously in this presentation, but also everywhere you read, you know, data is the new gold or new oil, I guess. Uh, I don't know if we say that a lot anymore, but data is really a strategic asset for FSI, but for everyone, right? You need to deliver AI use cases across many business lines. You have to respond to increasing regulatory scrutiny. You have to generally embed data in all processes for everyone. Right? So the key is how do you do it, right? Um, there's only a number of data scientists, number of data engineers, and it's unrealistic to think, hey, we're just going to hire a bunch of people and they'll transform our organization, our culture, and our, our decision-making process. Right? Um, this is a very homemade formula that's not scientific uh, or numerical at all, but if you look at your capacity to execute as an organization, right? Capacity to execute, i.e. capacity to properly transform and in implement change towards more data-driven. You basically have a couple of factors. One is strategic directions. Is the board and are the C-level people aware and committed to doing the right things, prioritizing the right investments in data and in people so that it becomes a reality. And then you have to multiply that by, hey, I have data professionals on one side, the guys who will actually build the analytics, data science and AI models, and I have domain experts, the guys who are supposed to use those systems, those data products in their everyday decision making. Right. So what's their combined ability to execute weighted by their productivity, right? How quickly can I access data, build their models, and then use that in their day-to-day um, -day processes, right? So not scientific at all, but just a way to look at, you know, what does that mean for an organization? And so what we've seen is really you need to work if you properly want to transform and accelerate on three dimensions. One, strategic direction, right? So we've run things like data literacy program for execs, um, get them to really think about what are the critical use cases, who is doing what on the market and what works, and what's the ROI we can expect from this or that use case. And here what's critical is tying it back to strategic initiatives. You can't say, hey, LLMs are cool, we want to do something that's, you know, fun, and it has to match whatever the board and the CEO are putting out as strategic initiatives for the company. The second is data professionals, right? There's a couple of things there. One is, well, we used to have a lot of data experts who are, for instance, working in things like SaaS, right? Um, many organizations are thinking about what's next in terms of tooling. So the upskilling, reskilling, and making sure they're comfortable with the technologies and languages of data science and of the new world is something that takes effort. The second thing here, which is, um, I guess, a pet peeve of mine, is this notion of citizen data scientist. I don't necessarily like the term, but what it means is the expectations for analysts have changed, right? We used to write a couple of SQL queries or do some advanced spreadsheets or do some BI reporting. Now people are asking you, hey, go one step further. Can you use a bit of predictive modeling to do uh, more advanced insights, right? Can you build data products and actually build applications, production-ready applications that will refresh insights, data sets, integrate into Salesforce. So it's not necessarily about building production-level AI models, but it's about becoming better at building data products. 
And the last piece in data professionals is this notion of federated versus centralized data team. Where do you put your data professionals? Do you have a central team? Everyone goes to them and say, hey, I need this use case. And then six months later, it comes out or nine months or two months. Um, or do you embed data professionals in the various entities and make sure they're closer to the business and to the beneficiaries of what they're building? Um, and the last piece of the puzzle is domain experts, right? So you may have, I don't know, two or 3,000 data professionals, and then you have 40,000 domain experts, right? So people who are actually in the field, on the front line, talking to customers, how can they use data in order to make better decisions, right? And here, there are a couple of things that are critical. One, this trend of data democratization and self-service, right? You cannot expect them to go and write SQL queries on you know, curated data sets to get their insights you have to ensure that they have the right platforms, tooling, and data products available to them in order to quickly get the answers that they need and make the right decisions. And a lot of it comes through low and no code platforms. Data IQ is one of them, but there are others, obviously. This ability for less technical users to quickly understand, build insights, and then operationalize them. And here, kid, uh, something that's that's critical as well, and we've seen that too many times, right? Business or domain experts will go to the centralized data team and say, hey, here's a 70-page PDF of what I want. Go build it, right? And then nine months later, it comes back, and it's completely relevant to what the business wanted to do, and you end up with something that's sitting on the shelf somewhere, and you've spent multiple millions building something that's not relevant. So meshing together in a better way and having collaboration and literacy across business or domain experts and data is a critical aspect. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do with Data Ec, really enable the various profiles to work together and to accelerate and enhance their capacity to execute. That's really what I wanted to um, um, talk to you guys about today. So remember, right? core areas, customer value, financial crime or KYC generally, and NLP, supported by major trends, which are modernization of the tech stack and upscaling and data literacy. That's really what we see as the key trends where there's momentum and the things you should be thinking about as you plan and strategize for data acceleration in financial services. And with that, I'll hand over to Anne-Sophie to close up the session. Thanks a lot, Vincent. I hope you all found it uh, insightful. Again, this is the first of a series of webinars that we're planning to do in the next couple of months. So uh, stay tuned. We'll keep you posted on dates and topics. The next topics that are aligned are ESG reporting, finance reporting optimization, and credit scoring. So uh, this is going to be a deep dive on each session on one of those use cases and how we have helped customers uh, achieve their goals on each of these uh, topics. Here is also a link to um, supporting materials, the title for financial services. It's a set of use cases, trends, observations, and uh, success stories with customers um, that you might find uh, insightful to complete the session. And if you want to find anything else about the Taiku or the topics that Vincent tackled today, just don't hesitate, write me. Uh, this is my email address. We'll be more than happy to help you out. Thank you very much and see you in the next session.